When I read earlier this year that after 23 years, Bruce Kulick has announced his retirement from Grand Funk Railroad and longtime Bob Seger guitarist Mark Chatfield will take his place. I have to say, I knew that Don and Mel had made it clear that there would be no Mark Farner on stage with them again. I'm sure they have the reasons, although they won't really speak out as to why, and honestly, I don't blame them. But this is a great example of where actions speak louder than words anyhow. And since Don and Mel haven't really had much to say on the subject since acquiring the Grand Funk name, all we are left with is their actions to go on. And as to why they won't bury the hatchet with Mark and let the original Grand Funk get back together on stage one more time for their fans, who knows? So when I read Grand Funk was moving on without Mark Farner once again, it stung. And also really opened my eyes even wider on how doggy dog the music business has become. So let's take a look back on the band and the guy who without him, there never would have been a Grand Funk Railroad. Guitarist, vocalist, songwriter, and the main reason the band Grand Funk even exists, Mark Farner. He was born in Flint, Michigan in 1948. Mark lost his father at nine years old when the car he was in along with a fellow co-worker was T-boned by a train while crossing the tracks. Mark's mother would go on to remarry and have two more children with Mark's stepfather, giving Mark a total of five siblings. Mark says he did okay in school and was a pretty good athlete playing football and running track, but a knee injury at 15 ended his athletic career. In the time he was recovering from his knee injury, his mom rented him an acoustic guitar to pass the time with. And as time would pass, it wouldn't take but five short years before Mark Farner would become the guitarist and lead vocalist in one of the greatest power trio rock and roll bands of the 70s, Grand Funk Railroad. Mark gives Dick Wagner a lot of credit in getting him started and the confidence he needed to start writing songs and develop his guitar playing style. Dick's encouragement is what Mark needed at that time in his career. Mark says after that slap on the back and boost from Dick, he set up one night and wrote the song Heartbreaker. If the name Dick Wagner doesn't ring a bell with y'all, he was to later go on and be the guitarist for Alice Cooper and was a co-writer on quite a few of Cooper's top 10 hits, including Welcome to My Nightmare and Only Women Bleed. Mark, who was playing with Terry Knight in the pack, along with drummer Don Brewer, went through a few changes, and when Terry Knight left and moved to New York to start producing records, Mark took over lead vocals for him. Mark says after that, the band changed the name to The Fabulous Pack, and he was just a stand-up frontman doing lead vocals and playing very little guitar. The band at the time was five-piece, but it wasn't to last very long before splitting up and going their separate ways except for Mark and drummer Don Brewer, who decided to stick together. There's a few different sides to the story of how Grand Funk became a power trio. A few say it was old friend and bandmate Terry Knight's idea. Mark said it was his and Don's idea to find a bass player and go on. Either way, Mel Shocker was contacted and the trio was formed and they started working on original songs. Terry Knight came into the picture or was possibly already there. My honest guess is forming this trio was Mark and Don's brainchild. And after getting Mel on board, Mark and Don contacted Terry Knight to see about a recording contract and possible management. Terry Knight took the band over and got them booked in July of 1969 at the Atlanta Pop Festival as the opening act and was asked to stay and perform for the two following days. And they did the same on August 30th through September 1st at the Dallas International Motor Speedway in Louisville, Texas for the pop festival there. Grand Funk Railroad would open all three days of those concerts. Also in August of 1969, Grand Funk would go on to release their first album. And then in December, they would release another album. Then in June of 1970, yet another album, and finally a live album in November of 1970. And this would go along with a very full touring schedule. Besides booking the band, Terry Knight would also produce those Grand Funk albums until the big split and lawsuit would hit, which came in early 1972. Yes, Terry Knight's production and promotion got the group out there, but one main factor of the band seems to get lost, and that is, 
the major force that Mark Farner was to this group in the beginning. Just look at it this way. Of the first seven albums recorded by Grand Funk, all of which went gold, some platinum, one was a live album, and one was a compilation album of earlier recorded songs. So let's just take a look at the first five studio albums, all of those having new songs. Those five studio albums had a total of 40 songs on them. Of those 40 songs, Mark Farner wrote 35 of them. 33 of them he is credited as the only songwriter, and two as a co-writer with Don and Mel. Let's just take a minute and think about that and let it sink in. 35 of the 40 songs recorded over a three-year period. The band lost a lawsuit with Terry Knight and ended up broke with only the Grand Funk name to take with them. So they brought in keyboardist Craig Frost and got back to work. The other members were writing more and the band, along with Todd Rundgren, were producing the music. They came back with some strong albums and seemed to be back on top. That was to only last a few more years. In late 1974, Jimmy Einer, who produced groups like the Bay City Rollers, the Raspberries, and Three Dog Night, took over producing Grand Funk. And I guess the idea was to make them more mainstream and radio-friendly with songs like Bad Time and Some Kind of Wonderful. They didn't release any new music in 1975, only the Caught in the Act live album, then came back to release two more albums in 1976. Now up to that time, every album Grand Funk put out went either gold or platinum, but the two albums in 1976 didn't even come close. Grand Funk's run was over, and the band would eventually break up. they try and make a comeback and release a few albums in the early 80s, and again break up. What next? One more reunion run starting in 1996 for a couple of years. Then the final split. This is where the business side of music raised its ugly head once again, and took a big bite out of Mark Farner. At the time, the three members individually owned the Grand Funk trademark. In 1998, Don Brewer suggested they form a corporation. They all agreed and papers were signed. After that, the band didn't do many shows at all. Why? I never really found any information. But in 2000, they were trying to set up shows to get them back out playing, and at that time, Mark himself said that he'd asked for a bigger cut. Did he deserve one? I'll let you be the judge of that. But Don and Mel thought he didn't and went on without him, basically kicking him out of the band. For me, I still believe that Mark Farner was the driving force that brought Grand Funk to the top. And without him, the band would have never existed. He wrote or co-wrote almost 90% of all their music. He was the main vocalist, guitarist, and songwriter. He also played harmonica and keyboards. But now, they were basically a classic rock band who would not be recording new material. They'd be doing shows, living on past songs. I guess many of them forgot about how they got to that point. No matter what, it looks like Mark, Don, and Mel will never appear together again on stage. So what are they doing now? Well, Terry Knight, who helped bring the group to the spotlight, promoted and produced them, and then ended up basically owning them, would be stabbed to death by his daughter's boyfriend in 2004. His daughter, who was 17 at the time, and her boyfriend lived with Terry in an apartment in Temple, Texas. His daughter and boyfriend were arguing. Reports say methamphetamine was a factor. Anyway, Terry tried to stop the argument, and the boyfriend turned on him and ended up stabbing him numerous times. Autopsy testimony from the medical examiner said Knight was stabbed in the heart, lungs, kidney, spleen, and abdomen, and elsewhere on his torso. He bled out and died at the scene. He was 61 years old. Don Brewer and Mel Shocker have kept the Grand Funk name and have been out doing shows under it for going on 25 years now. They have keyboard player Tim Cashin, lead vocalist Mac Carl, and guitarist Bruce Kulik, who, as I said in the beginning, retired at the end of 2023, and Mark Chatfield was hired to take his place, and the band plans to play more dates in 2024. Mark Farner, pictured here with Randy Bachman, 75 years old now, and still seems to be doing pretty good despite a few health issues. He says he tries to contact Don and Mel about a reunion every year, 
but that seems to fall on deaf ears. I think most fans will have to agree now that a Grand Funk reunion will never happen with the hiring of Mark Chatfield. But I do think many of these musicians owe Mark a little recognition and a thank you for their paychecks. Because without Mark Farner, that Grand Funk name they legally obtained and have been working under for so many years would never have existed. Thanks for watching.